Oh cool, I've always wanted to be black. If one remembers the classic Superman movies from the late 70s to early 80s, one will be reminded of the scene from Superman 3, where the people in the traffic light come to life. This specific scene stands out due to not only how ridiculous of a concept that is, but that such a power surge would create what was once a non-living symbol into an animated creature of life. This concept, that was only shown for literally 13 seconds in a film in the 80s, was adapted almost 40 years later into a puzzle game that takes real-life aspects and marries it with 2D platforming. After being developed for 5 years by Skookum Art, with an initial budget of 21000 as a baseline goal, which included software, legal department, marketing, events relating to the game, and mostly towards the game's development, their supporters ended up raising over $30,000 for this imaginative project, which led the developers to reach two of their stretch goals. While one might have not have been aware of such a project until it was available via the Steam store, it brings a smile to one's face that such a concept was able to be fleshed out over years of development, and would have been harder without their support circle. Just as how this game started as a circle. While existing as a circle in this spotless void, not too long after you have such an ability to choose one of two characters. Once it's chosen, the game integrates a soft tutorial to establish a baseline of understanding between the player and the character. It's established in a way where the instructions are placed in realistic situations. For example, most of the instructions are on TVs throughout your journey, such as E to interact and F to pay respects, instead of just words on a screen, which shows the importance of world building practicality. Yes, Yes, it's practical that you can cross bridges. Yes, it's a practical to match opposing half circles. Yes, it's practical that if you disconnect a trail, you have to start over. Yes, it's practical that if you die, you splatter black ink. And yes, it's practical to not overuse the same sentence structure on repeat in an attempt to connect several loose bullet points, which makes your writing suffer. Overall, the tutorial lets you feel the world, establishes practicality, and that's the end of the demo. When you buy the game, you pick up where you left off. Which is nice considering how not fun it would be to replay the same hours of gameplay you've already finished. After purchase, one can note that this game is a very long journey that doesn't stop. Which means that you have the ability to save and quit whenever and wherever you want. And it's important for a platform puzzler such as this since it's one of those games that you get frustrated at, quit, and then come back later and then the answer is so incredibly obvious to you. Such as G-Shift, such as Chuzzle 2, such as Bad North, such as Chuzzle, such as gosh darn it I did it again. Point is, we've seen this time and time again, where a developer recognizes that everyone needs a break every once in a while and everyone individually needs a different amount of breaks. So games that do have this feature where you can just save and quit wherever you want are games that I have way more of a respect for in general. And sure, there is a time and place for games that do have manual save points, but let's be real. We all know that familiar feeling where you have to get off of a game ASAP, but you can't because there's no save point anywhere close to you, which at that point, that's just unnecessary anxiety. Regarding the easing of anxiety, as long as you don't disconnect a path, then you don't have to start over, meaning you can move around signs all you want without fear of it just disconnecting out of nowhere. Despite this, however, wariness is crucial due to the fact that if your bridge that you've traveled on gets destroyed, the item you've obtained is also destroyed if you use that bridge specifically to get that item. Making that item respawn as well as every single effect that has been impacted because of that one bridge. These instances regarding paths, as well as many others, is as simple as eliminating which paths lead to dead ends, going by section instead of looking on it as a whole, and if need be, destroying all of the paths and starting from scratch. On the exact opposite side of the spectrum, the intermediate portions with no paths to create, where no puzzles need to be solved, opens up the player to to refresh in a sense, not just from the puzzle they previously finished, but to the open scenery. Everything in the world moves realistically, and everything from the sound department is believable. The city vibe with its skyscrapers, bustling traffic, signals, crosswalks, and construction all intertwine together to create an atmosphere that is so realistic. Neon lights high above humanity, glowing bright in the sky, shining to whatever soul may gaze upon it. A powerful train, a mighty steed, 
a majestic metal beast. All of this and so much more to explore as you travel through all of the signs. The longer the day goes on and the later in the day it gets, the more chill the music becomes, which opens the world of sound regarding everywhere you may travel. Generally, the music is soft, specifically using strings, sounding as if it's a jazzy kind of beat. Once it becomes night, a slow piano ballad serenades you with its light touches of notes. Just as the music changes with time, it does so with place. That is to say, the same song sounds different depending on your location. If you are inside, the music sounds like it's coming from an intercom, but when you're outside, it sounds as if nothing can contain it, and doesn't sound muffled whatsoever. Once one has fully appreciated the sound in this game, one can notice the art of how one can travel. Now in this game, it's commonplace that signs are used to travel. However, this specific game stretches its limits regarding how far they can go with this concept. Pencil lines, white signs, caution signs, black signs, blue signs, green signs, red signs, college entrance signs, plaques, bulletin boards. <laughs> bulletin boards. <laughs> okay, dude, whatever. Chalkboards, mobile devices, traffic lights, and train consoles. Which means, yes, you can travel from the sign world to the digital world. Which, honestly, was never expecting, yet I'm utterly amazed by how diverse the developers went with what signs you can travel through. Since there are so many different signs, obviously they made a rulebook defining how each and every sign works. Which is why the developers totally set a rulebook, totally legit, totally gave the developers my address, totally, totally, totally. Now there's about 11 key factors here in defining the characteristics of signs. Signs that are metal boarded or thumbtacked can't be moved and nothing can get in them. That's pretty obvious in and of itself because if you were to bolt down, you know, like an actual metal sign, yeah, it ain't going anywhere. Also, it means you can't put a doorway into a metal boarded sign. Two, placement of the signs have to be on something. Well, yeah, signs just can't float by themselves. Unless you're in Gary's mod. Three, the signs look so realistic. This is something a mom would probably say, but at the same time, the signs do look so amazing and so realistic. My arm is so tired, oh my gosh. Four, the character changes color when on a different colored sign. Ah, see, now, now this is a very key point. See, if you were to not change the color of the character when you do switch signs, it wouldn't look realistic. Or good, for that matter. So yes, the addiction, wait. Why did I write the word addiction? So yes, the addition where the character does switch color when it does switch signs was a good call. Five, signs can move if hanging. This is one of my favorite physics about the signs. When the sign swings, everything in the sign gets skewed, as if it's actually in the sign, which is a really cool feature. Similarly, when a sign is bent, the things in it skew when it's on a pole. Six, metal bars can block the signs. This is so that way the signs are forced into one specific area, which is a pretty neat way to add diversity to the levels. This book is so heavy. Why do they make so many rules? Seven, scenery changes the type of signs, which means the more you progress, the more different kinds of signs you can find. Eight, when you place one of those pieces on the Game Boy thing in the digital world, it appears in real life. See, now this is an interesting concept of things in the digital world affecting the physical world. Kind of poetic if you ask me. Nine, place signs anywhere possible. What's funny is that originally the signs placement was realistic at first, but then all of a sudden you find signs in the most absurd places that it really makes you chuckle. 10. Bricks keep the signs in contained spaces. This is a way to not only keep the levels diverse by adding new elements, but also to add more of a challenge. 11. Electricity on signs retract pistons when connected. Using power on signs was a very good concept that kept gameplay interesting. In fact, there's a level where you're mostly connecting a bunch of wires to three signs, which was a nice change of pace. Thank you. Totally legit physics. Now besides the sign physics, there are certain elements of the game that bring either a goal or a certain amount of functionality to the levels. These would be buttons, switches, keys, moving platforms, elevators, trampolines, lasers, crates, doors, springs, boundaries, saws, and a green gas contraption. Buttons and switches are on and off controls for multiple situations, such as for the moving platforms, elevators, trampolines, and lasers. Moving platforms can either block lasers, help you reach a higher area, or just be a general annoyance in this stupid level. Elevators go up and down, which can occasionally be enabled by a button or switch or from the inside. Trampolines can be used to reach higher distances and are either already on or need to be enabled by a button or switch. Lasers can kill the character, so they either have to be turned off or blocked in some way. Crates can be pushed and stacked, which means that they are the perfect candidate for climbing on or blocking lasers. Two forms of doors, the first
first being opened by a key and the second being opened by either a button or switch. Springs can be used to connect two areas of electrical input. Boundaries forbid items from leaving. Saws kill you. Last of all, Yes, which although for the longest time I had absolutely no idea what it was for, basically it allows you to move a tunnel that you weren't able to move previously. It's worth mentioning when one notices the smallest of details to show that it doesn't go unnoticed or unappreciated. The simpler of the two is in the train. When you're traveling from area to area, the code you input flies off the clipboard. The other one was an Easter egg. In the windowsill of a shop, the book Message Sent is by Nathan Frisian and is a real life novelist, comic book writer, and voice actor, which was pretty notable to see, mostly because he was actually one of the details designers credited in the game. While I know that there are many more subtle references in the game due to the reward tier, design a decal, where you can get your name, gamer tag, or icon in the game, the two details that were mentioned previously were ones that I specifically noticed during research. <laughs> Nathan Frisian. More like, end mission. Before you place the final piece in the Game Boy Advanced, all of a sudden, a hand is holding the Game Boy. A hand. We haven't seen a single human in this game, and now all of a sudden you get to play as said human. This completely changes the puzzle dynamic, because now you go from 2D platformer puzzler to FPS puzzler, where now you can move things in the digital world and the physical world, which I honestly was not expecting, but at the same time, I am very much not disappointed in the slightest. This makes sense why the entire time the scenery looked incredible, because now you can look at it in the flesh from a rooftop. This leads you to the final puzzle. While you're not sure at first what to do or how to accomplish it, since you're new to this body and first person point of view, it takes a while to realize how to beat the task at hand. Eventually you realize that this is where it flips on you. The paths you make in the sign affect real life. Which is such a polar opposite concept to literally everything you have learned. Everything you knew about the physics of this game completely turned on its head, which is a perfect way to conclude a journey. To give the player a challenge that they aren't prepared for, yet have the ability to figure out based on what they already know. Success after a long mental battle leads you to what you think is your home. A worn out apartment. Searching through every single area leads you to a cabinet, where one last piece makes you discover that you are a computer geek that apparently knows how to affect reality with this machine. With this sort of ending, I'm led to believe that you can interpret this game and its meanings however you so desire. Surface Level says that you're a computer geek in an apartment that knows how to affect reality with a machine, but I don't believe that's the point of the game. I believe that there's a lot of subtle hints and reasons behind the entire journey and especially the ending as a whole, and these subtle thoughts and reasons don't become clear until you finish the game. Sure, I believe everyone's will be different, but to me, when you stick to an idea, the final outcome can be worth it. Taking control of your own destiny, in a sense. The game's end is a metaphor. It symbolizes that one man can use his talents to his advantage and aim where he is reaching. Obviously, you can't just rip a ginormous hole in your apartment and sail across the sea, but this is a metaphor for a person reaching nirvana. And even when the person gets to where they want to be, there's still more that needs to be done. All you gotta do is walk the straight line. Regarding the entire journey of the game, the main core is the question, how much can you, in the digital world, affect the physical world? It's a simple question, really, but a powerful one. We've seen this time and time again of the digital world affecting the physical world. Sure, we've seen plenty of examples in a fictional game, but at the same time, we also see it in our physical world. This is why it's important to be cautious of what you do or say in the digital world. It's why I choose to be positive, to highlight the good in the world and show that people's hard work shouldn't be forgotten. Thank you.